Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. My name is Judith Makara Cooper, and I have the privilege of chairing this session. Wow, what a journey we've been on this last week at Decol 2022. I must admit, I felt challenged and humbled and full of hope and despair, angry, full of tears and laughter, and most importantly, strengthened to do more as a treaty partner. Today, I'm going to open the session with the karakia that I use when I feel I'm in one of life's important moments, surrounded by the things which are part of the spirit and of the heart. Ko te kupu te kupu, ko te atoa te atoa, ko ranganui ki runa, ko papatua nuku ki dāroa, ka matea ai te tanata, ka pō, ka ao, ka awatea, mauri ora. So now I need to do some housekeeping. And first of all, a reminder about our community code and uh, the way that we will be in this space with one another. And of course, I think the last one might be quite um, apt for the session that we don't take ourselves too seriously. And uh, they'll all remind you also about the chat, which you're using well already. Thank you, keep on using the chat. We also have a question and answer function. And if you want to answer, que ask questions, please use that rather than put the questions in the chat. And we will do um, as much as we can to answer as many of those questions. There's also a closed caption link that'll be put in the chat um, that you can also access. And we have a moderator on hand, Jenny Rankin, who will be facilitating things in the discussion. We welcome you to um, share um, your thoughts and anything else that you think will be valuable to everyone who's on this session. So our topic is uh, critical treaty analysis, a mechanism for monitoring the Crown. We have four, presentation, uh, four presenters, Donna McIsaville and Jackie Kidd, Heather Kame and Tim McCreenan. I just feel I have to start with a disclaimer because I just came from a wonderful fire, fireside chat where Kate and Tama, um, I just was so touched by their discussion. And when I agreed to chair this session, I thought, easy, four presenters, they'll present for 10, 15 minutes each, then we'll have some questions. But no, this is a fireside chat, which means it may get a little random, may get a little messy, may get a bit of crea creative, as these are amazing individuals that we have here um, having this fireside chat. So um, just let's see how it unfolds. But I do have complete faith we'll be taken on an amazing journey. So I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and tell us what they want to, uh, us to know, but also something about the critical treaty analysis tool and what brought them to this work. So Donamic, we're going to let you um, begin this. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. Kia ora hui tātou katoa. Ko te mātua tahi, he mihi ki te rungarawa, i o mātua kore, he honore, he karoori, he tanengua, he maunga rungo ki te whenua, te whakāro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Uh, ko māmari te waka, ko te rārawa te iwi, ko te uri o hina te hapū, ko te uri o hina te marai. Uh, ko Dominic Sullivan tōku ingoa. Um, my name is Dominic uh, Sullivan. I'm Professor of Political Science at uh, Charles Sturt University and an adjunct professor in the Centre for Māori Health Research at uh, AUT. I'm from uh, Te Rārawa in the, the far north. Uh, my, my mother's people are, uh, are from that, that area. And uh, as I said, I'm a, 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 a political scientist, so I'm interested in power and where it comes from and, and why and who has it and who doesn't and what makes power legitimate and what makes it uh, illegitimate. And those are all themes that we um, see in, in treaty history and we see it in, um, in the present as well in terms of um, um, the, the ways in which the, the Crown and Iwi and Hapu um, sit alongside one another, interact with one another, and um, contest one another's um, perceptions of, of the way the world ought to be, and one another's perceptions of what uh, te, uh, utility means. So while, while certainly 
critical utility analysis as a tool for monitoring the crown. It's, I think, also much more than that. And um, one of the ways in which I think it is, is really importantly much more than that is that it um, assumes that the crown belongs to everybody. The crown is not the power of the Pākehā polity alone. And therefore, it really has no authority to position itself as an adversary to, to Māori. It is properly, if we read you know, the third article of the treaty, uh, particularly, the crown belongs to Māori as much as to anybody else. And that means that there need to be fair and reasonable opportunities for Māori to influence the workings of the crown as shareholders in its sovereignty, in its sovereign authority. I know in, you know, in, in legal theory and legal thought, um, sovereignty is often understood as this um, absolute authority indivisible in the way that you know Hobbes set it up all those years ago. Um, but I think in a, in a liberal democratic society, it, you can't think of, of sovereignty like that. It, it just doesn't work. Sovereignty is the domain of the people. Now that obviously raises the question, which people? And if the answer is all people, then um, how are Māori part of that in a way that is, is meaningful and um, in a way that creates opportunities for, for equal voice in public affairs and equal voice in, in policy making. And critical utility analysis, I think, is an attempt to do that, to say that, um, you know, we're here, we're part of this as well. It's not your authority alone in competition with ours. Um, you know, we're, we're here as legitimate shareholders in this body of authority called the Crown. And um, we're, we're going to claim our share um, of influence over how it works. And I think in, in various ways at each of its steps, uh, critical utility analysis allows that to happen. And um, you know, while, while we wrote it as a sort of a retrospective evaluative tool, it um, you know, does have potential too, I think, to influence how new policies are developed. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's quite easily modifiable, I think, to that purpose. And the other thing that I think is really um, interesting about critical utility analysis, and we're sort of seeing it start to work in this way uh, a little bit, is that although it um, arises from our interpretations of te tiriti, the, the articles, the preamble, and the um, commitment to, to uphold wairuatanga, um, it arises from all those things. It, it's not dependent on them, which means that it is modifiable, I think, outside the crown to NGOs, public entities, and so on, who um, think that the sort of ideas implicit in, in tertility are, are useful for, for their work, even though they're not the crown and they're not hapu, they're not partners to tertility. They might still find CTA a useful tool to help them in their thinking. And similarly, I think it is um, a, a tool that might help um, Indigenous policymakers in other jurisdictions in Australia and Canada and places, for example, to, to think about how they do things. Um, of course, no treaties in Australia, people are, are working on them on what they might mean, what they might entail. And I think CTA might contribute to those sorts of conversations. And of course, Canada has lots of treaties of its own, but our CTA is not um, dependent on Te Tiri or Te Waitangi. So it is, I think, maybe something that policymakers in, in that part of the world might find useful for the general principles of justice and fair political relationships that it um, advances. Thank so, you, kia ora, I'm I'm right. Right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Jackie. <clears throat> Tēnā la koutou katoa, ko Jackie Kitsaka ingoa nō um, i te tahu tōku papa nō Aerani ahau, i te tahu tōku mama uh, nō Ngāti Wiwi me Napuri, uh, ko te ahuahu te maunga, ko o Māpere te wai, ko Waitangi te awa. 
ko Napuhi te iwi, ko Ngāti Henera me te uri tani whao ku hapu, ko Parawhenua, ko Rāwhitiroa o ku marae. Ai, ko Jackie. Aho. I'm an Associate Professor with the um, School of Clinical Sciences at AUT. I'm a latecomer to this um, to this rōpū here, and I um, I'm mihi to my colleagues on the panel who are the ones who came up with um, critical to 3D analysis. Uh, I I'm my my research most recent research background I guess is in health equity. It's very qualitative. It's very around um, listening to Fano stories about their strengths and their grittiness and their determination to get good health care and, and build their health literacy. Um, and I was getting increasingly frustrated by the number of research projects that were being done in that space and the number of amazing Fano stories that were being dismissed. And they're still being dismissed, but I saw in CTA an opportunity to challenge the Crown, particularly in the health sector, at the very core of the reasons that they were able to do that dismissing. Um, so my first work with these guys was around the um, cancer agency, the, um, the cancer action plan, and we've kind of moved on from there to, to other areas, particularly in health, that, that's where my that's where my passion sits. And I'm, yeah, I, I thought that it would be a more positive experience, but I still feel like we're identifying deficits, we're identifying problems. Um, I'm hopeful, I hold these two spaces where I'm really hopeful that moving into the Māori Health Authority um, and the changes that we're seeing and the energy for things like this, this series, um, that we're seeing something positive. I still am disappointed that we still need the CTA. We need to be doing this kind of work to hold the Crown accountable. Um, but yeah, I will leave it there with, with, I guess, just saying my motivation for being involved in the CTA is to amplify those whānau voices and create a space where we can value them instead of dismissing them. Heather. <coughs> Um, kia ora tato. thanks for opening the space for us, um, Judith. Thanks to the tech team. Thanks to my mates in the room and the crowd. Yeah. Um, ko the came fryer toko ingwa. Um, ko tangata tritia hau. I grew up on the land of Ngāti Wai and live on the land of Te Kawarawa Maki. My background's in health promotion and public health and social justice activism. Um, And my little opening story about the CTA is that Tim and I were asked to give evidence before the Waitangi Tribunal. And so we did what we'd done a bit of, which was pull apart the primary health care strategy because we knew how to pull apart policy documents. And we wrote up our paper and thought, oh, this will be great. We'll publish it. And then no one wanted to publish it. And so this is a story of... Um, of, of kind of persistence because it got rejected a couple of times and then we decided to we'd always been looking for a bit of an opportunity to, to collaborate with Dom so we 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 got and got involved with Dom and and through that process of yarning we worked out that we'd written a methodology paper and then people wanted to publish it and it's been a little bit of magic what happened since so it's so it's about Sometimes when the publishers say, no, this isn't good enough, it's a great opportunity to dig deep and find more. And so um, thanks to those people that we won't name who rejected the CTA original publication number one. Thank you, Tim. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, ko Tim Makrina, taku ingoa, no Whāriki Research Group. Um, uh -huh. um, I'm a, a senior researcher at um, Fariki Research Group, which is linked to Massey University um, under the leadership of Helen Moiwaka Barnes. Um, I guess I've been there for 20 years or thereabouts, um, working 
um, particularly at the interface between policy and um, uh, health disparities, Māori health disparities, Pākehā health advantages, um, in a manner that uh, made me hypersensitive to um, the way in which policy um, shapes social fabric. Um, and see, you know, relate, related work, um, talking with uh, many uh, Māori advisors who have been deeply associated with um, policy formation and development and application, um, just getting a real sense of the way in which they are marginalised in that process in spite of being brought to the table, um, marginalised in the process so that their voices are lost and um, their insights and wisdom are wasted. Um, it seemed to me that um, some of the, some of the um, processes that the Crown has introduced, um, particularly a focus on treaty principles, tertiary principles, um, as distinct from the texts and the words and the sentiments and the commitments um, that were made um, in 1840 and beyond, um, is, is something that drew me in my um, kind of uh, slightly naive, simple-minded way back to 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 the the actual text of Tetariti. and so um, yeah, the, when when that experience that Heather related had 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 uh, happened, we started to formulate how how we could um, develop a tool that might um, address those kinds of policy shortfalls. Um, and yeah, with Jackie's help and Dominic's help, um, have have totally um, transformed the rude, rough ideas that we had to begin with into something that seems to be catching people's attention. And um, it's a work in progress. Um, I think Dominic has outlined wonderfully um, some of its potential and and implications. Um, we're really keen to hear um, what you make of it. Um, what we can do to strengthen it and enhance it, but keep it clean and, and simple and powerful for the assessment of these extraordinary things called policies in our society. Kia ora tato. Kia ora Tim. Um, we realise that everybody um, in this session may not have uh, an understanding of the critical treaty analysis tools. So Heather's just got a very short PowerPoint. We're just going to run through a few things so that everybody's got some information. Thank you, Heather. Kia ora. Um, the, the critical to treaty analysis, um, when you're doing it retrospectively, involves finding a policy document and you go through these five stages. So the first stage is you have a high level look and see how it talks about te treaty, how it talks about Māori, what kind of Māori frames and things it has within it. And then you do a very close reading. This is when you're likely to write, start writing notes. You do a, high, a, a, um, a close reading where you look at it against the five elements of the Māori text. So you look at it to see what it says about the preamble, what it says about the relationship between Māori and the Crown. You look at what it says about Māori involvement in decision-making and um, how it frames um, tino ranga tiratanga equity and kind of wider with tanga. So you, you have a detailed look through and then there's a set of indicators that we've developed. And then you look at those indicators and you work out, you kind of rank them to seek, to kind of give a real rough steer about how well it's com it's aligned to those to the articles. And then rather than just pulling things apart, it's important to offer solutions because otherwise it's just incredibly negative and no fun. So you off, then you um, look at what the determination in your close reading and try and plug some of the gaps, identify how things could be done better. What are some other ideas which would have strengthened this policy? And then, of course, you have the magical expression of tino ranga teratanga, which is the Māori final word. 
because often when people write about Titriti, they do it at a really high level and there's not much substance to it. So that's part of why we work with the five elements of the Māori text. But with the Māori final word, instead of looking at Titriti as at parts, it brings it all back together again as a whole. And it's um, an overall assessment by the Māori colleagues that you're collaborating with in order to do a CTA about how they see that landing. And so here's um, our indicators that we've um, working on. They're very much under development. So if you've got a better indicator, because there'll be people that are probably sharper on indicators than us in the crowd, please send them in and we'll reference you and we'll use them going forward in our CTA. So um, init initially we had, um, you could rank them poor, fair, good and excellent. But after a recent CTA, we were forced to add silence when it said absolutely nothing about any aspect of Tuturiti whatsoever. And so that's a fairly alarming addition. We may end up adding additional categories, but that's the ones that we've been using lately. So you see they're kind of high level steers about trying to capture um, those parts of um, Tuturiti. Do chip in, team, because I'm not feeling at my smoothest here, here right now. But And so those are the papers that have been published so far, and we've got one in press about the New Zealand disability strategy. So we're getting a whole body of work. Um, and as I've said in the chat, if you want to get hold of one of them and you can't, just contact um, me or one of the others, and we'll be able to send you the articles if you want to do a read. Um, Jackie and I, and um, sometimes, or me and a range of characters, have been doing workshops on CTA. So we've got two coming up, which are fundraisers for the AUT branch of the Public Health Association. If you're a member of the association, it's free. If you are not, you get to pay money. But it might best be smart to join the Public Health Association because there's never been a better time for collective action for public health. So we do a one-day session walking people through how to use it. and the thing about it all is that it's not as tricky as we might lead you to believe. But here's how you find all our characters. And there's um, Dom and Jack, particularly uh, uh, major forces in the Twitter world. So make sure that you follow them on Twitter. Try not to be a time hogger, but that was the whirlwind tour. So it's a way to, yeah, put a line in the sand and say this policy doesn't look that Tetriti compliant, it's not engaged well with Tetriti, this is how they could have done better. And we've yet to find the shiny, um, glamorous policy that we think, yeah, that's really rocking it. But at any time that could happen. Go to Heather. Um, so just to go now to the fireside chat, and um, I think Rose Black in the chat said, I find the CTA the most liberating way to work with policies from my role in public health at Waikato. So I wonder if um, that's a place to start. You know, why does it work? What 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 are the things around it which which people are applying? Um, for someone like Rose, it's been a liberating way to work with policies. What, why, why do you think people are finding it a liberating way? So, but please take the conversation wherever you think it needs to go. I think you've said before, Judith, it's because it's not rocket science. It's really straightforward. Yep. And we spend a whole day talking about it. But really, if you have a good understanding of Tetriti and the policy context that you're wanting to engage with, it's really simple. And, and it's, it's one of the most frustrating things to see what is essentially a straightforward, I mean, simple is probably the wrong word, but a straightforward treaty or to treaty that um, that lays out very clearly what the expectations are from from both parties has been turned into something really muddly and really frightening um, and in fact it isn't it isn't either of those things and when we look at it through those um, those determinants those um, indicators it's just really clear whether what you're working with is um, is going to be compliant or not or has been compliant or not. So um, yeah, that I mean, that's one of the things that appeals to me. And that's one of the things I think when we're 
when we're presenting this work is that people go, I never really thought it was that simple. And it is, it is not complicated. I think it's inclusivity um, is maybe what makes it useful too. There's, a, there's an assumption that Māori are part of this, uh, not as an adversary or a competitor, but as legitimate participants with, with whose distinctive perspectives are, are legitimate. And it, it provides a way for giving effect to that assumption. And as people have been saying, a very simple way. And it's also easily adaptable if people don't like bits of it, if they, you know, they don't like the indicators that we're suggesting, well, they can replace them with their own. And um, I, I noticed somebody in the questions here has asked whether this is uh, transferable to other policy domains. I think criminal justice was the um, example they used. And yeah, I think it is um, because the same principles and, and values of of Māori voice um, are, are re relevant wherever we go in, in the policymaking realm. Yep. Cool. Yeah. For me, <coughs> I think I think there's also um, there's a there's a dimension in which there's actually incredible depth to what we've distilled um, into CTA, because for me, one of the key um, touch points, um, groundings is Matiki Mai. Now, Matiki Mai is um, focused on constitutional transformation for the entire society, the, the country, the, um, the, the entire way that we do what we do. And I think that having the insights derived from that extraordinary piece of work that is so connected to. Um, hundreds of marae up and down the country to thousands of Māori participants who, who joined in Hui is something that, um, you know, I think gives a real solidity to um, what seems perhaps a pretty straightforward thing on the surface. Um, we've definitely tried to keep it that way, um, but all of us um, and all of our connections and um, influences and inspirations are, are kind of built into this piece um, in a way that we hope um, reflects both the gravity, but also the, as Jackie says, that the kind of straightforwardness of Te Tiriti o Waitangi um, in guiding us through to um, something, a better, a better account of social justice than we can actually play, lay claim to at the moment. Cool. Heather, you want to talk? Okay. Um, I just wanted to say something about the Māori final voice because I think I've been reflecting on that a little bit lately and I think that perhaps we present it in a way that makes it sound like it is only the final voice. Um, and what Tim was just saying about Mātiki Mai reminds me that, um, that the, the only way that CTA is working for us as an Orpu is that is that collaboration, that Matiki Mai style of, of coming together into that third space and that treaty space to on the work that needs to be done and to, to decide on the determinations and then to have have that final voice at the end. For me, that Māori final voice also means the right to veto at the top and the right to, to have um, equitable conversations all the way through. And I loved what Thomas said this morning about that positive tension of having people come together in order to create something new. And it's like, you've got this friction, but it's a, but it's a, a friction that grows something new rather than um, the imbalanced friction um, that we're currently seeing in, in non-treaty compliant spaces. So I'm hearing one of the reasons I was reflecting on it is I'm hearing increasingly about people wanting to use it, Pākehā wanting to use CTA without having a Māori partner and then inviting somebody at the end to go, this is what we've done. We need a Māori final voice now. And that becomes really problematic. And I think maybe that we either need to write about it or we need to um, include in our writing the importance of that values-based equitable relationship going into the process that then results in those five 
five stages. Does that make sense? This is the first time I've talked to you guys about it too, but it's just something that, that I've been kind of mulling over. Yeah, I think we, yeah, we need to do a bit more work on, I, I think, defining what we mean by Māori final word and, and, and you know, when, it, when and how it's a, a, a appropriate. Um, you know, there's a, a risk here, I suppose, of, um, you know, policymakers saying, oh, there's a Māori in the office down the hallway, he can come and, um, and, and do this for us. Um, and, and that... It's not what we have in mind, but we probably need to give a bit more thought to exactly what we do have in mind and, and express it a bit more more clearly. So um, I, I guess we're interested in what, what others think about that and how that might work um, in an effective and, and fair manner. Oh, and certainly we're wanting to have more yarns and certainly a number of characters are using CTA. Some people are using it in their research to analyse data, to look at curriculum, to look at competency documents, to look at policy retrospectively and to inform prospect of development of policy. And so, indeed, I haven't had a chance to yarn to this crew because we never get to be in the same room particularly, so this is a bit of a treat for us. So I think it would be exciting if we can, you know, write the perspective paper about how to use it prospectively, but also to create a community of learning so that we can hear from people about how they're using it and we can keep refining it. And so there's kind of like a, a clearinghouse where all the work that people are doing around this is, is centred so that we can kind of give it a home, give it a virtual home and a place where we can yarn and support people using it. Because if it means that we get people doing stronger policy, we're onto something. You know, I think we, we have started to do that to a fairly significant degree with a, a subsequent paper we wrote. Um, in 2019, uh, the Cabinet Office issued um, a, a, a circular containing instructions to ministerial advisors in the, the state bureaucracy, um, instructing them on the, the, the questions that they needed to ask when or answer when preparing policy advice to ministers. And uh, that was quite a significant document because in a perhaps a more comprehensive way than has ever happened before, um, Cabinet set out its expectation that, um, you know, tertidity, and it, it used the, the term tertidity as, as well as, as treaty, um, what, what was um, to be assumed to be, to be relevant. Um, whatever the advice was that ministers were, were seeking, whatever the policy domain. So we, we had a look at that and um, we, we, we found in, in spite of that, there were still areas in which it could be developed and, and strengthened, maybe to give Tatiriti a bit more authority. Um, and you know, we suggested some additional questions that um, policymakers might ask themselves in, in, in preparing advice. So. Um, that's another paper that I think, um, you know, people might find interesting or not, but it, it gives an idea as to just another way in which CTA has been used and, and how it might contribute to um, policy development as opposed to policy evaluation. There's quite a few people um, asking questions that, that work in government departments. And, <laughs> and, um... Kia ora to the Crown agents. Corrections are uh, really trying to get their head around how um, they they could apply this and could it be applied. But um, I'd just like to read one of the questions um, because I think this captures uh, where, where people are at. And Heather, prepare yourself for this, prepare your heart for this. But um, thanks for sharing this amazing mahito. As a Pakia Tanatariti working in government, I see conversations happening around the three Ps as a positive development. Can you help us understand the shortfalls of this approach? I've observed the ideas around 3D principles and articles are seen as radical or bewildering for many um, Pakia public servants. How can we move on from that? I'll, I'll put the reference to the Waitangi Tribunal and the relevant page. Thank you. Which says very clearly 
This is the Waitangi Tribunal report for the health outcomes, Y2575, where they said that the three Ps are reductionist and outdated, and by the time we get the new health legislation, they will be gone. So for any government department, any NGO, anyone that's still using the three Ps, it's time to put them in the freezer and let it go. There's a world of difference between the Māori text, which is not a complicated document. I believe it's one page. Um, I don't think we need the Ps. I don't think they, I think they've served their purpose, but it's time to put them in the freezer and it's time to look at them. Look, at, let's just look at the Māori text and it's not that difficult. There's people to help you. There's a world of difference between participation in Tinaranga Teratanga that I'm sure either Jack or Dom can explain or Tim or Judith or any of us, but they're not at the same level. It's like a cartoon versus an um, epic novel, the difference between the, the three Ps and the Māori text. I'm just going to put on the mute. I, I think in... Um... Re response to that question from, from corrections. Um, yes, I, I do think this is quite easily um, adaptable and, and applicable to, to corrections policy. And I would suggest maybe reading our paper in conjunction with the um, cabinet circular paper that I, that I mentioned. And I think that second paper will perhaps um, give you some ideas uh, about the questions you might want to ask yourselves when, when developing policy. And, and as Heather mentioned before, um, she and, and, and Jackie have run a number of, of workshops. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, maybe to go into this sort of topic and the depth that's needed might require a, a workshop specifically for, for corrections. Um, so maybe, you know, if that's of interest, get in touch and among the four of us will presumably be able to work out how we can we can help with that. But I think um, to, to answer it in a few minutes now is probably a bit, um, bit too much. And yeah, I did see other people saying, you know, maybe it's relevant to other, other government departments, school boards of trustees and so on. And um, yeah, I, I think the same thing there. Um, we, we could easily do, do workshops there. There's an interesting question for also from um, Susan Knox, who said, could this policy be adapted for new health development initiatives, such as the development of new public health programs, thinking that we're, you know, the health reforms, et cetera. I'm just interested in your response to that question. Um, well, we know that it is being used in a couple of areas specifically for that. So mm. we've, we've talked about it being retrospective or prospective. So mostly we use it retrospectively when we're writing about stuff. But also the um, prospective idea is about having it kind of as a template to go, if we went ahead with this draft, if we went ahead with this statement, what would a CTA look like? Mm. Um, and it's... So I think there are, I know that there, I'm not sure whether you're here, Rhonda, you might be. Um, there are people who we know are using it in that, in that way. Um, also, I, I just wanted to add somebody, some people are saying, you know, about it being used as a tick box exercise, like for example, by yeah. board of trustees. I think they'd have to turn themselves inside out to do that because it isn't rocket science, because it just says, here's a scale, here's a question. Are you doing this in this policy? And um, I think it's kind of hard to fudge. I think it's really clear if it is fud fudgeable. I mean, the others will probably know. They're taking me on a political and activist journey, this team, because I sit firmly on, in my, with my whānau research hat on most of the time. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what you guys have got to say about that too, because if it is able to be used as a tick box, then it's not flash. But I well, don't think it is. I think that would be profoundly disappointing, Jackie. But I've not seen I've not seen a horrendous one yet. Like I've just seen really admirable efforts in deep thinking. But I've seen like like I think about the heat tool that we use a lot in the health sector, and I've seen that used in a way that was completely the opposite to the intentions of the authors. So I think people 
once you put something out in the world, we can't control what happens. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we never have that experience. And if we do, I'm thinking we'll be reaching out to whoever held the pen that day and ask what happened. Yeah, I think it, you know, although it is a, a simple instrument, it doesn't really lend itself to being used as a tick box kind of exercise. Because um, when you uh, apply it to the analysis of a of a policy, it's going to tell you things, for, for better or worse, and it's what it tells you and what you how you respond to, to that information that is is important. So um, to say, oh, we've done a, a critical utility analysis of this uh, policy um, doesn't really mean anything by itself. It only means something if you. Um, explain the significance and, and how you might respond. There are some questions about how could this link to or be involved with or reflect Matiki Mai and the constitutional reform um, that's, um, yeah, I know, that's um, being undertaken. Like, are there links here? Are there... What's what would the relationship be? Oh, there's quite a, there's a number of questions asking about that and constitutional reform at all. Mm. So, yeah, for me, I suppose my understanding of the New Zealand Constitution is that it's informal and uh, that it's um, incremental. So it's basically built up over time out of um, the way in which people have done what they've done and um, taken, taken that praxis, um, that weird mix of theory and practice that allows us to do what we do um, and, and kind of codified it to some extent, but it's still widely informal. And one of the things that I took from that kind of understanding of the constitution or the constitutional arrangements for the country is that while that's quite um, um, a, a kind of a bottom-up approach, um, it's been turned into a top-down approach. And I think that that, sorry, I'm getting slightly muddled here, but um, you know, I think that the constitution is, is in that sense, the sum total of what we do in the, in, and how we do what we do in the, in the country. And so um, I think this is one of the points of connection between um, CTA and Mātiki Mai because it's, you know, lots of people are interested in um, um, taking up the, the challenge of using CTA in their daily life, in their um, institutional and um, 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 sort of everyday practices where policy is impacting. And I think those things trickle together um, into, into um, basically those, those broad informal constitutional arrangements that we have. It's like, you know, that um, while the constitutional arrangements can be, can be um, discussed and, and um, um, defined and, and so on and so forth, they're, they're constantly fed um, by the realities of what people are doing on the ground and the codification of those. So I, it feels like there is a link um, and that uh, CTA can contribute um, to those broad discussions and movements towards constitutional tra transformation that we are involved in. Yeah, I'm, I'm the odd one out here, I suppose, and, and not being a a great enthusiast of uh, for Matika um, Mai, and and the reason for that, and the reason why I think CTA does potentially does something much much bigger and, and more significant, is that Matika Mai, as I understand it, is is ba basically takes uh, the idea of biculturalism and develops it into a very strict form of binationalism, and it gives the crown an exclusive ethnic Pākehā character. And, um, you know, it uses phrases like the Crown's people as exclusive of Māori. And while, you know, Te Tiriti affirms Rangatiratanga and Rangatiratanga belongs in 
uh, iwi and, and hapu and Mateke Mai give some very significant consideration to, to what that might mean in practice. I think in, in positioning Māori outside the Crown, um, it, it, it's limiting the spheres of opportunity for Māori influence. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure if under the strict binationalism that Mataki Mai encourages, uh, we could even have CTA because the Crown would be making policy for its people, Hapu would be making policy for their people, and there'd be this very neat separation. And um, I, I'm not sure that, that culturally and, and socially and, and economically, um, New Zealand actually works with such a neat separation. And I, yeah, I'm basically, you know, politically a, a, a liberal. Uh, therefore, that I, I believe that the crown, as I said earlier, is, um, if you like, the, the the repository of our collective sovereignty. Therefore, we've all got a right, not just a right, but an obligation to be there, and to participate. And and for Maori, that means I think participating as Maori. So from distinctive cultural perspectives, with reference to historical circumstance, with reference to the power structures of, of colonialism and, and with the ability to respond to those. Um, and therefore, I, I think CTA is, is potentially quite different and potentially transformative. It doesn't necessarily transform the constitution. Um, but it certainly transforms the nature of policy making and in the, the way in which political ideas are transformed from abstract ideas into, into practical um, uh, politics. And, and just briefly, uh, I'm reminded of, of Geoffrey Palmer saying that the problem with the New Zealand constitution is that one can't find it. Um, it's in so many different places, pieces of legislation, the letters, patents, standing orders of the, of the parliament and, and so on. It's all over the place. But I think uh, um, Tim's suggestion that it's the, the sum of what we do is probably um, a, a pretty good political definition. And um, CTA, I think, is about changing um, part of what contributes to the sum of what we do and is maybe useful in that respect. Wow. Cool. Just watching, I'm just watching some of the chat um, and, and some of the questions. Sorry, I'm Judith. I, I just I can't help, but I'm just watching yeah, too many things. <laughs> um, just in terms of, I guess, people who are not Pākehā yeah, or my Māori. Next question. <laughs> yeah, um, asking, asking where that space is and also wanting to reflect that the Crown is not Pākehā. The Crown is all of us. So, so when we're talking about... Um, and now hang on, I want to take this into a slightly different space because what I'm seeing kind of unfold a little bit is the, the slapping down of a people. Um, and, and one of the core principles of the CTA is that it is mana enhancing. And one of the things that we have to be mindful of is that for every policy that comes out that we're critiquing, there are people who have left pieces of themselves um, on the floor in their attempts to get something more equitable through or their attempts to get to 3T recognized. Um, so when we're writing CTA, it's not an exercise in, in kind of whack-a-mole and telling people that they've done a terrible job. It's more an exercise in demonstrating where things could have been made better or where they could be made better next time. And recognizing what I'm really what I am really concerned about when we're, when we're doing, especially the ones on really recent policy, is recognizing how many Māori there were in the room and how, me, how disenfranchised and um, dismissed their thoughts often were. And we saw that in the, um, in the Simpson review, that we are talking, what, what I guess I'm wanting to talk to when we're doing a CTA is the people who have tried so hard and had it been had their input whitewashed out of it because it's not politically expedient or it's not the right time or or your only research 
that says that we should have this in there is qualitative or it's only whānau voice or it's only the voice of the disenfranchised. So um, I, wanna, I want to reinforce, we haven't talked about that, but I want to reinforce to people that this is supposed to be a process of mana enhancing, of building a better world, of working with Mātiki Mai and working with New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand as a whole, not as a, a couple of groups of people who are adversarial. And I loved what Dominic said in the beginning is this is not about, this is, this is about, this is about the Mātiki Mai vision of, of working together in a way that honours Te Tiriti rather than, um, rather than continuing this adversarial binary, you know, when you have to have a winner and you have to have a loser kind of thing. And I'm going to stop talking because we're nearly out of time. I just, I just wanted to reintroduce some heart into this and go, this, Aye. Aye. this is mahi a wairua for me. This is mm. not, this is not a political whack-a-mole situation. And, and, I, and now I'm going to forget what I was going to say. Dan. Sorry, Hedera. Sorry, no, um, no, 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 no. It was, it was a riff from, it was a riff from that. But I know what it was. It was like, when we do the CTA, and this is from what Jack said, is that it's all about the document in front of us. So it's not about the people that are holding the pen, and it's not about the organisation who wrote the policy document. We're commentating on what ended up on the page. And we want to, I want to say that to get a particular sentence in there, like that was their contribution, and they went really hard to get it. So when we are saying we want people to do better, we know that it was a victory to get what you got in. So cheers to all those policy advisors that got the, the content in that's in that document. And so we're not absolutely like Jackie's saying, we're not having a go at you. We're encouraging people to get better. So this is about what ended up on the page. It's not about the authors. It's not about the organizations. Mm -hmm. And there, there is a lot of people, there are a lot of questions. And just to say, we will give all your questions um, to, to the panelists and we will attempt to answer them. There are a lot of questions, of course, about people wanting to know how this is actually applied and, um, and examples. And there are examples. And if you look at some of the publications that um, Heather put up in her list, and, and I think in the chat, um, I saw Annabelle Ferry talking about how she's using it around curriculum, et cetera. So people are really making this happen now. So um, if you're really um, keen to know more about how it's being used and where it's being used, um, we can absolutely share um, that with you. The, the questions are amazing. They I've just have the privilege of sitting here reading them and people are engaging with this on all sorts of levels which just says what its importance is but I'm just aware that um, as Heather said you know next time we do this we need to have night long sessions where we could really get in and and unpack all the things that um, we we so want to ask but I just want to give each of you an opportunity just to say something to finish off um, maybe return to that heart space about why why this is so important and around the difference um, that we hope it will make. So Dominic, we'll start with you. <clears throat> Sorry, Judith, I was, I was responding to a uh, question there and I, I didn't hear what you said. So that's all right, Dominic. That's yeah. no problem. I'm quite used to that. So look, it's 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 my my usual world. But we're just finishing up, Dominic, just something you'd like to people to be left with you know, about the critical analysis tool and from our session? Well, I guess I'm interested in, um, you know, when, when people use it, how useful or otherwise they, they find it, and interested in um, ideas for, for further research that it might stimulate, mm. or even further questions that um, it might raise for people, even if, um, you know, that hasn't led to research per se. So um, what it means for people practically, uh, good and bad, and what further questions that it might raise, good and bad, I cool. think would be interesting for us to, to know about. Thank you. Jackie. Um, I'm just completely distracted by finding out that my daughter's on the zoo. Kia ora, Tracy. <laughs> um, 
I, I have just really enjoyed this. I, I really like every time, like every time we come together and start talking about this in a, in a different space, we realize that there's more work to do. There's more work to do in every single sector, but there's also more work to do for us as a team in creating a more usable tool, a tool that might, you know, address some of the questions that you guys have got. And we're also, it's a conversation that we have really often is, um, we're really mindful that this is a rupu of Pākehā and Māori, um, which is excluding a significant number of, um, of other people who need to be a part of that. So um, it's an area that, that we're really mindful of as well. So I guess onwards and upwards, and you never stop learning, eh? So watch this space. Thank you, Jackie. Heather. In a, in a break with tradition, I'm not even going to talk about the CTA. My final word, I'm going to say that if you're holding the pen and you're the other policy person to get those sentences in, we need you to be absolutely pushing the edge because that makes room for, it, it creates more room. And we've got a hell of a lot of whitewash policy. We did a paper earlier on where we looked at, I think it was 116 policy documents and 68 of them didn't even mention the word Māori. It is not pushing the envelope, including the word Māori in health policy. So I'm sorry, we've got to do better. Die in the ditch, we'll be right there beside you to bring supplies and first aid to get you back out of the ditch and back, on, back in the field because we need you. Die in the ditch, we're with you. Don't die in the ditch. <laughs> no. Over the top and do whatever you have to do, but don't die in the ditch. Tim, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, just to thank um, the panellists and especially the audience for your engagement mm, mm, and mm. your heartfelt questions. Um, this, this is um, obviously something, a work in, in progress, as several people have said. Um, we hope to make it stronger um, and the reason we hope to make it stronger is because it can make a difference to the way in which policies that um, we run for our communities and in our communities um, produce equitable outcomes um, for, for societies and for society. So yeah, just big thanks to everyone. Lovely cheering, Judith. Um, thanks a million for the ones behind the scenes that we can't see who have, um, you know, held us and guided us. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Tim. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you to the four of you. It has been truly amazing and an honor. And thank you for the spirit that you bring to it and that you don't just touch our minds, you touch our hearts with it. Thanks to Jenny and Jamie and everyone behind the scenes. Um, remember, Pikachu events coming up, register, you want to be there. The recordings will be made available um, on YouTube and um, please join the Treaty Based Facebook page. For those of us who are Tana Treaty and Tawiwi, we stand on many, the shoulders of many giants when we come to this work. And um, we've seen some already over these weeks, Jane Kelsey, Oliver Sutherland and Milne. But I want to finish with probably our greatest Tana Treaty giant and um, Glenn used part of her uncomfortable blessing this morning. So acknowledging Mitzi Nen, her uncomfortable blessing. May you be blessed with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so you may live deep within your heart. May you be blessed with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of the earth and its people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May you be blessed with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may you be blessed with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Kia ora, everybody. Thank you. Kia ora, Kate. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.